Hello and welcome back to the Racing Riders Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Crandall. A fun and entertaining episode this week, I would say. Garrett Smithley is the guest and he is quite chatty. I love chatting with Garrett. He's got great personality and really could be a star of this sport. So, with that being said, to be a star, you've got to get some attention. So, this episode is a little bit different because what I'm going to do here, guys, is every so often I'm going to do what's going to be called a get-to-know episode. And for those of you who have followed me for quite a while will know that a couple years ago when I was at popularspeed.com, I did a get-to-know driver profile, which had nothing to do with racing. It was more along the lines of, who are you? Where did you come from? What do you like to eat? What do you like to watch on TV? And then after that, when I was at NBC Sports, I did a little bit more of that in a Xfinity Series spotlight. It was focused on Xfinity Series drivers. So that's kind of the basis for this new little series, I guess you could say, that I'm going to do on the podcast is get to know a driver away from racing, their interests, their likes, their background. And Garrett's the perfect guy to do that. Again, he's so entertaining. He's got quite the background. He comes from a military family. Of course, he did not go into the military. He has a theater background. He loves SpongeBob SquarePants. He has apparently an obsession with Panera Bread. So he's quite the guy to start this off with. So we're going to get to know Garrett Smithley away from racing. I'm going to do a few of these every so often. Probably not every week. Probably not every other week. But every so often, they're going to pop up. And it's going to be with drivers who, again, maybe not well known. Maybe who don't get a lot of attention in NASCAR. And even some of the younger drivers coming up. Uh, I've got Riley Herbst in the, po- in the podcast lineup. I've got... Dalton Sargent in the podcast lineup for stuff like this and a few others that I haven't recorded yet but I've got some interest in doing so it's going to be stuff like this drivers like that that we're going to bring attention to even maybe drivers again that aren't young they're not you know young guns or in development maybe somebody like a Stuart Friesen you know for, for people who really don't know who Stuart is but he's making quite a bit of name for himself in the truck series now so that's the goal that's what this type of podcast is going to be about so with that said Let's jump into it because this, again, is really entertaining. So I hope you're rating. I hope you're reviewing. I hope you're spreading the love and everybody is subscribing. Hey, let's get to the show. This is a good one. Here is Garrett Smithley on the Racing Riders Podcast. You're all over the place with social media. I try. That's awesome. I I try as as much as I can. I, I love it. Yeah. I didn't for a very long time, just because it, it's just, like, I didn't have a Twitter, like, when Twitter first came out, I was like, ah, I'm not going to get Twitter, because I thought it was just, like, <laughs> I thought it was just, like, Facebook without, like, the walls. It's just, like, it's just statuses. That's all Twitter was to me back then. And now, that's where I go to get all my information. That's, that's where I good. go to get everything yeah. out there. That's, that's a good way of looking at it. That's just what I thought, and then it's changed, and now I'm yeah. probably on Facebook at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. So, well, like I said, you're going to kick off this new little series, this kind of get to know series. So let's start with this. What's the first thing you do when you get up during the day? Like you've been sitting around waiting on me to figure out the roads here of Kannapolis that are yeah. throwing everybody for a loop. So, yeah. but what's kind of like your routine? What's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? It's a little bit different this week because <laughs> my weekend was like kind of just all over the place and my flight schedules, like I left Atlanta, I went down to Atlanta to do a Legends race and I flew out of Atlanta at like, like I think 5.30 or 6.30, so I was up at 3, and I flew into New Hampshire, I missed like 45 minutes of first practice, it was, my bags got lost, it was awful. And um, Wait, so you actually missed practice, because I saw your post about your bag, yeah. but you actually missed practice. I missed the first like half of it, which it's okay for us, because we don't usually run like a ton of laps, so we got one run in, and like that's good enough for us. Wow. So, yeah, but I mean, we did. And then, um, and then I flew back on Sunday, and that flight was at six thirty, and I was staying forty five minutes away from the from the airport. So, I'm just now getting back like into it like a normal sleep schedule. <laughs> All right. So, like, how about this? How about like on a random Wednesday afternoon? What's the first thing you do when you wake up? Check your phone, take a shower. Yeah. Or, like, what's? Yeah. So I'll 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 wake up, check my phone. What do you go on to Twitter? everything I just yeah. I do the circle I do like Twitter's first and then like I'll snapchat because I'm I love snapchat it's snapchat's changed so much now though I don't know about snapchat anymore but so there's snapchat and then Instagram and Facebook and like obviously text messages I have let's see I have 
60 unread text messages right now. Wow, Mr. Popular. I, the problem is if I, if I read them and I don't respond right then, then I'm not going to respond, so I leave them unread. But I obviously, there you go. <laughs> See, I do the same thing because if you go in, you look at them, <laughs> yeah, because you just want to know what somebody said. Yep. But then you forget to go back and respond. And respond. I'm so guilty of that. Yeah. My, my friends and family are constantly on my case for that. Yeah. So I, I have my morning routine, you know, like shower and all that stuff, and um, and then I'll get on my computer and just kind of check emails and like see what I got going on for the day. Normally, like my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday consists of you know sponsor relations. So, um, either debriefing with sponsors from the previous weekend, or you know trying to find other sponsors for the next you know several races. It mm-hmm. depends on you know if we have a bunch of sponsors coming up, then I'll work on that stuff and make sure everything's good, hero cards and whatever. Make sure I have all my stuff done, and then get to like if it's like you know three or four weeks out where we don't have a sponsor coming up then I'll start working on that and seeing if we can come up with something. So, um, you know, just a lot of that stuff. And then, um, like, like on, a, say, a Monday, I'll put in all my expenses from the weekend into, you know, QuickBooks and all that stuff. So, because I have my own LLC that I never thought that I'd be, like, a quote-unquote business owner, you know, being a race car driver, but I've had to do that for sponsor stuff and, and taxes and all that stuff. So, um, you know, office work, typical stuff that people don't realize that, that you still have to do. Um, I hate running, but I have to do it. So I bought a treadmill because I hate running outside. So I can just, I'll set my iPad up and do treadmill. Yeah. So I'll do Keep that. yourself distracted. Yeah. I'm the same way. Exactly. I don't want to think about it. Like I can play basketball or something like that all day long. I, and, I get it. And, and probably exert more effort doing that than running. But running, like, you're thinking about it. Mm-hmm. I can't stand it's it. It's the same thing with exercise. Yeah. It's like if you think about, oh, I have to go exercise or work out, you don't want to do it. Yeah. So it's like, okay, if I can find something I enjoy doing and distract myself with it, then it doesn't become a workout. Yeah. Then it's just something else you can do. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll set up uh, my iPad on the treadmill and, and like, watch the whatever race I'm going to next. I'll, I'll watch because I usually watch it anyway, the last race that we were there. Do your homework. Um, study up, yeah. Watch in-car footage and things like that. So... Um, I'll do that at, at some point. Uh, normally in the morning, I didn't today because I knew I was gonna see you and and be doing the podcast. So I don't want to be all like you know worn out for that. But um, yeah, that's my typical morning. And then it just depends on phone calls and and you know if I have an interview set up or if I have you know lunch or something like that. It just it just depends. It's so it's not repetitive, which I think is like it's fun. It keeps things fresh. But it is, I mean, that's the work part behind the scenes that people don't realize that, mm-hmm. you know, we do. We get to go, we do the work so we can have fun on the weekends. And for you, you're also, you're not just driving the race car. It sounds like you are handling a lot of everything that lets you get in that race car. Yeah. The business side of things. Like yeah. you said, you're doing your interviews or your hero cards or your sponsor stuff. Yeah. I, I don't, um, you know, I, I didn't have the money coming in to NASCAR, so I had to go find it, and I'm having to do that every every year, and whether it's new sponsors or whether it's people that have been involved for a number of years. This year we had uh, had Fame, fame-usa.com come on board uh, for like eight races, and, and we've been working with them since 2016, and we've grown it from one race to two races to now eight races, and hopefully more. So, yeah, so I'm, you know, I have to make sure that I do the, the business side and the work side before I get to the race car because if I don't do that, then I'm either going to get to the race car and we're not going to be prepared and we're not going to have the resources to go do what we need to do uh, or I'm not going to be in the race car, period. So we had some issues with that last year. We had, I mean, I've, I haven't been shy about last year. It was kind of a sophomore slump for me. Um, but it's because that we didn't have the resources. We just, things didn't work out. So I'm trying to get ahead of things for next year now too. So, um, but it's fun. I've, to be honest with you, I've brainwashed myself from the from when I very when I first started racing, Bandler's Legend cars, all that stuff. To you know, I was obsessed with going racing. I was like, I have to get to the racetrack. I have to go. I have to go. I have to go. And when I stopped focusing on racing so much and started focusing on the business side and the marketing side and all that stuff, that's when I started becoming successful. Where now I'm ex- obsessed with trying to get the deal done. Like, you know, oh man, this is Shark Tank stuff. We're going to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's fun for me. Yeah. So Garrett Smithley, is that your born given name or yes. any nicknames? Yeah. Uh, Just Garrett, it sounds like. Garrett Smithley. Like, 
when I was in theater and stuff, like they call me like Gare Bear. Really? Yeah. The girls did anyway. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> popular with the girls? Uh, I mean, I, I like I was the only race credit ever in my school, so that that says a lot. That, that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't yeah. awful. <laughs> so I wanted to act. I wanted to talk about theater, but since you brought it up, we'll talk about it right now because, again, when I did a feature on you, a profile feature a couple years ago for NBC Sports, you did mention that. But I wanted to go back to that for those who have not read that or who don't know. Yep. Explain your theater background. Yeah. So I've been doing theater. I probably started theater ten years before I started racing. So I was four or five years old. Um, my mom was big into theater. And she and both her and my dad were very instrumental in making sure that we had access to everything that, that we wanted as far as um, activities go. So they made sure that we played baseball, which I love playing baseball. I played baseball all the way up until eighth grade from you know three, four years old playing t-ball. So we played baseball, we played football, we, we, um, we did all those like quote unquote normal things as you know young uh, young kids but then then they they put us in like chorus and and we did um, we did like dance classes and we did theater and we did all these like other things that you know weren't so typical um, so so that was like from a very young age I just had a deep-rooted love for music and, and theater and, and and basically the fine arts so like my first show, I think I was cast at six years old. I was the youngest kid in the cast as Music Man. And we ended up, I, it, was, it got delayed, so we ended up doing it two years later. So I was eight years old when, when I was in my first you know, quote unquote show. But um, I, I always did different things you know, as, as a kid. I think graduating preschool, we did um, Rainbow Fish <laughs> and I was the octopus. I still have the cardboard cutout when I was the octopus up in my room. But uh, I, I think that was like my first like, like on stage kind of show thing. So I ha always had a passion for it. So fast forward, I, we, I born in Pennsylvania, so that's where it all started. So we did that, and then we went to we moved to Virginia, and Virginia is where it really kind of ramped up. So I lived there for from six to I think ten years old, and that's where mom made a lot of friends in theater and and she was in this theater company and we did a bunch of shows together um, both me and my brother and then we moved from Virginia to Georgia and I was in sixth grade and that was kind of where my rebellious stage started <laughs> so I I went off kind of oh I'm not gonna do that that's that's stupid that's you know whatever it's lame I'm not gonna I don't want to dance anymore that's that's whatever so but she made me still take chorus and from about I don't know, six or seven or eight years old, I, I played piano. So I took piano lessons and she made me continue doing that and continue doing the, the chorus stuff. And so from, eighth, from sixth grade to eighth grade, I didn't do any theater at all. I, I really, I feel like I wanted to, but for some reason I was like, eh, I don't, it's, it's not cool, quote unquote. <laughs> I wanted to be a popular kid. So going from eighth grade to ninth grade we had to take electives or we have to choose electives so i had like three or four or five backup electives that that i had selected and uh theater was like my third or fourth like backup so like i had my like main ones that i really wanted to do and then i had these other ones that i kind of wanted to do and then i had these well i've done that in the past i guess i'll select it by grace of god i got selected going into theater in uh, in ninth grade and that was probably the best thing that ever happened in my life because I was like a really shy kid, and um, I think we all going through middle school, you know, it's an awkward time, right? I wanted to be a popular kid. I wasn't a popular kid, you know. I was nerdy, whatever. But then getting into theater, ninth grade, I had this friend group, and we got on stage, and we started performing. I started performing again, and that really like gave me the confidence back. And I was like, wow, like this, like I can go up and on stage and perform in front of hundreds, hundreds of people and, and not have an issue with it. So why am I worried about being popular? Why am I worried about all this other stuff? And I feel like that's what gave me the confidence to then when I got to the point where I had the opportunity to go racing, I told myself, I said, well, I have the confidence. I feel like I can do it. I'm going to go do it. And I feel like that's kind of what started my confidence going into racing and saying hey like this is really really hard but I can go do it and 
you know, obviously the the theater stuff has helped me in racing with interviews and with TV. I was going to say, that goes such a long way, I think, to why we see you as you are. Like, you're very outgoing now. You're not mm -hmm. afraid to come walk around a media center or engage with the fans or whatever. Like, that's now your personality. Like, it's complete 360, I guess you could say, from yeah. what that kid that you used to be. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, that, you know, 6th, 7th, 8th grade kid, like, seeing me as that kid and now seeing me you know driver intro stage and, and up on the chevy stage and and you know even being like i was a keynote speaker at a fame conference um two years ago and just talking for an hour just about my story and about why i'm so passionate about fame and all that stuff you know in front of hundreds of people just talking i'm i feel like i'm pretty good when i when there's a moderator when there's an interview you know i can do that I struggle with like if I'm in charge. Yeah. Then all, all of a sudden it's like, well, now I got to call the shots. <laughs> so, but I feel like I've I've improved, you know, with that. Um, I'm so far removed from when I did theater. From like my last show was senior year, so I was 18 years old. But again, everything that you did has stayed with you. Makes sense. Absolutely. No, it it really has. There was a couple years when I first moved to North Carolina that. I still retained it and then there was a couple years when I really wasn't racing and doing anything. I wasn't like upset or anything but I was working for the Petty Experience full time and I wanted to be racing and so that was kind of a different stage where I kind of lost a little bit of that. I, I Not that I shut down and, and you know went into a hole or anything like that but it was just I wasn't doing interviews. I wasn't doing any TV. I wasn't there wasn't anything going on. I wasn't Facebook living. I wasn't. I don't even think Facebook Live was the thing back then. So I did lose a little bit of it in that year. It was kind of a transition year for me. But then as soon as I got in 2015 when I started running trucks, and then 2016 when I started running Xfinity, and I started getting interviews and TV and, and doing these different things, it all came back. I mean, it's like riding a bike. I feel like if somebody gave me a script right now, I could memorize it pretty well and then go go do that. Right. I feel like I retained it pretty well. So you're a race car driver. I believe you have a brother. Yes. So what does your brother do and what do your parents do? Kind of how, is it kind of all across the board here? It, it is. It's funny. So my, my brother used to, he, he lives in Florida and he used to work for SeaWorld as a maintenance diver. Wow. And so at one point he was diving, I was racing, and my dad's a pilot. So my mom joked, well, I got one in the sea, I got one on land, and I got one in the air. That's amazing. <laughs> so I come from an aviation family. My dad mm -hmm. has been a pilot. He went to Embry-Riddle University, which is right behind um, Daytona. Yep. So that's kind of where his passion started in racing. And so he now is a fire bomber out in California. Well, they're based in New Mexico, but they fly all the, all the fires in California. So he's been doing that for two or three years now. I think his job's way cooler than me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, my brother is in school to work on planes. So I think he's got, I think he graduates in September, October, and then he's going to go work full-time uh, working on planes. And what about mom? Uh, mom is just biggest, stay, stay, stay at home. home. Cheerleader. Biggest, <laughs> biggest cheerleader. She tries to get to as many races as possible. It was actually a big deal for her at Kentucky. She's from Kentucky. So Kentucky, when I go back, it feels like a home track for me. I spent so much time as a kid in Kentucky, and I'm, I'm so close to all my family, cousins, and uh, grandparents there. And um, I made my second Cup Series start at Kentucky, and so I'm really, really glad my grandparents got to come out, Poppy Mima, and her sister, and her brother, and just basically all of my immediate family in Kentucky got to come out and be a part of that. So she was kind of in hog heaven there she she kind of felt like the superstar you know because she got to go up there early and see all her friends and you know tell her what was going on tell everybody what was going on so that was really cool for her but uh no I, she's uh since she was a flight attendant that's how my parents met they actually met in charlotte funny enough so it's funny that i came back to charlotte <laughs> <laughs> there you go and uh i think four or five years old she uh she retired from from um from doing that and just basically raised us. So everybody in the family puts in puts in the work. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's you know, they they always they always say when well, I you picked the wrong parents because we're not we're not filthy stinking rich and I'm like I I wouldn't trade y'all for the world because it's the support that's what I need 
you know they they taught me work ethic and and they said from the very beginning my very first sponsor in bandoleros they made me put together the proposal and do the whole thing they were there in the meeting but they made me do all the work so they always made me call i used to be deathly afraid of of calling people on the phone i was so afraid i don't know why and still to this day like i'm not afraid but i still kind of get flashbacks from when i was afraid so I just have that like little twinge of anxiety right before I dial the phone. <laughs> it is very awkward. I have to admit, I have that little bit of the same personality. I will text, email. I, there's just something about having to get on the phone for some reason. Yep. It's a very awkward situation. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but yeah. I, I I get it. I yeah. get it. It's um. I've been very blessed with uh, with the support that they've given me, and they they've always said, you know, mom always says it, it's not what I would have picked for Garrett, but it's what he wants to do and he's passionate about it and you know she'll and you're making it work yeah exactly yeah and i mean my dad kind of gave me an ultimatum when i graduated high school in uh, 2010 he said you kind of got a year to figure this racing stuff out i remember that story if you don't figure it out then you got to figure something else out to do yeah 11 months later, I was moving to North Carolina. Yeah, I remember that story. And I'm actually going to, in the show description when, when I post this, is I'm going to link back to that NBC story because there was a lot of stuff that I don't want to talk about on the podcast because, yeah. again, it, it is repetitive. But So tell me about your childhood. Away from racing and theater and everything else, what what type of kid were you growing up? Were you kind of getting in trouble? Were you shy? What was what was childhood like for you? So they always said that my brother was, was the ham. Of the two of us, we always, so when we grew up, we, we kind of looked very similar, so everybody thought we were twins. He's two years old, younger than me. So I guess, like, naturally, I was always kind of the shy one when I was in, like, situations that I wasn't comfortable in. If I'm, like, with family back then, if I'm with people that I know, if I'm with friends, then I'm, like, the rowdiest kid out there. I'm, like, you know, loud, obnoxious, whatever. But if I'm in a situation where I'm not comfortable, then I'm like, I'm not going to say a word. It's just, that's how I'm, and I kind of like that now a little bit. No, me and my brother were kind of rowdy, and I didn't like school at all. I wasn't good at it. My brother always tested way above me. He was always way more intelligent. I had to work so much harder than he did. He got in trouble for not paying attention because he was too smart. So that was a different dynamic. When we were in, let's see, middle school or elementary school, we we were we were active. We were always outside. We lived on seven acres of woods, or it was about five acres of woods. And so me and my brother would go out in the woods and just adventure, just yeah, all day long. Oh, I miss yeah. those days where people would actually go out and play with some dirt. Yes, that's we had a dirt now hill. Now it's iPad. We had a dirt hill. Yeah. <laughs> we played in dirt. We built bike ramps. I'm really, I told my parents, they just recently moved, like, not too long ago to, to a, a house in northern Georgia, and they, there's this big, giant hill, like, the driveway just goes down, and it goes down, like, probably half a mile. Oh, boy. And there was a, there's another hill, kind of like a little climbing hill kind of thing, and I told my parents, I was like, I'm really glad that I didn't grow up here, because I probably would have gotten hurt several times, and pretty bad, because I was a pretty brave kid back then. We did bike ramps, and we did all that stuff. So, yeah, we were always active. I was in Boy Scouts, so we camped a lot, um, did a lot of, you know, outings and, and things like that. We, you know, we would go to shows. You know, we would go, like, there was this one time mom took me and my brother to, I, I think it was like the opera or like it was like a symphony kind of orchestra kind of thing. And she tells a story. There was this lady that was sitting behind us, and she kind of just like, you know, snarled when we got there because we were like, I don't know, six, eight years old. And she was like, oh, great. There's these kids that are going to be rowdy. And she, I guess she she was kind of rowdy herself. And she she tapped my mom on the shoulder when it was over. And she said, I need to apologize to you because I thought your kids were going to be awful. And they were more they were more well behaved than I was at okay. this concert. So in public, we were like golden kids. Oh, of course. We didn't do anything. When we got home, we were running around rambunctious getting yelled at you know all that stuff it sounds like my sister and i <laughs> it's the same way like you could bring us out in public people would think we were angels yeah but at home you know mom would be like well, why do you do this to me yeah why, why? and kind of same with school when i first got to like a new year i was like good and then i wasn't like a bad i didn't do bad things but i was just 
I was misbehaved. I misbehaved. Yeah. I got called to the office. I did this and that, whatever. In third grade, it was so bad in, in first and second grade that in third grade, when I started like maturing, you know, being a better kid, I would get sent home with like a little envelope with like a cream saver and said, you had a good day. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, and then fourth grade, uh, fourth and fifth grade, I was, I was fine. And then um, all the way up through middle school, I was... I didn't get in trouble. That's wonderful. So if I was to look at your phone or your iPod, if you even have an iPod, I, don't, I guess those are probably kind of obsolete nowadays, or, yeah. or an iPad, or My, or, my or phone kind of doubles as my iPod now. So that's what I was going to say. <laughs> if I was going to look at that, what's the music that Garrett listens to? What, what would I find on there? A little bit of everything. Almost a little bit of everything, and I know that's a big answer. So in middle school, we'll go back since we're talking about childhood, I started listening to like rap, hip hop kind of stuff, and my parents were like, "Nope, that's not happening," because I didn't know what would, I didn't know what the songs were saying. Obviously, looking back at it, they're pretty bad songs. Right, but it's catchy. But it's like catchy, it's like, and you like you know move to the beat and all that stuff, you're not and they're like, attention to the words. "No, it's not, it's not happening." So they started taking me to classic rock concerts when we moved, when we moved to Georgia. Nice. And like, so my favorite band is Styx. And we got to listen to, to some really awesome bands. We got to go see Steppenwolf, and we got to so, go see um, Styx, Blue Oyster Cult, Foreigner, um, Def Leppard. Like, there was just Kansas. There was just so many awesome bands. So um, I've got a soft spot for classic rock. I don't like ACDC, you know, Led Zeppelin. Um, I love Leonard Skinner. Like, all those bands. Guns N' Roses. So... I like classic rock. I would say, like, if there was, like, a favorite... I don't listen to them as often as, you know, maybe I should. But classic rock, there's, like... I can go... There's there's no wrong classic rock. Fast forward to, like, now. Like, if I'm on the, in the radio not listening to NASCAR, Sirius XM, I am uh, probably listening to pop. Like, I so on Sirius XM, I'll have um, Pop 2K. Mm -hmm. So, like, love that station. I just started recently listening to, I think it's like Fly 47, so it's hip hop. The same era, mm -hmm. you know, 2000s hip hop. Um, I love that stuff. And then the EDM stuff. I love EDM. Like, I, I just, I got to go to Chainsmokers when they were at Indy to playing after the Xfinity race. And that was one of the, like, most fun nights that I've ever had. Because we got to race at the Brickyard, which is just amazing. Yeah. Just nothing like it. And then to, to do that, go have dinner with, I think Harrison Rose was still racing with JD Motorsports. So we went to dinner with him. And then we met up with some friends at, at um, Chainsmokers. And we just had the time of our lives. Just really loud, just EDM. Like if I'm in a car ride for a long time, and especially if I'm starting to get tired, I have like, I'll go to Spotify and my playlist that I have the most music on, it's called Electronica is what I call it on my playlist. I have, let's see, I'm going to pull it up here really quick. I have, I'm getting a phone call. We're going to decline that. <laughs> I have, let's see, I have 224 songs okay. on my EDM playlist. And the, the only one that comes maybe even close to that is um, my lake playlist when I go to the lake, and that has 100 songs. Okay. So. <laughs> gotcha. So it's a little bit of everything. Whatever bit catches, everything. Your, catches your ear. I have to be in a mood. I used to hate country music. And now, if I'm in a country music mood, mood, I have a playlist for country music. There you go. If you go to my Spotify, I think it's public. I, all my music's on there. Awesome. All my playlists. Okay. So. What about food? What are you eating the most? What's going to be either always in the house or something you always gravitate to when, you, when you're shopping or eating out? So, Is there a favorite? Uh, I'm not. I'm really bad at food. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was better at food. How can you be bad at food? Well, I wish I cooked more. I think I can I can cook because like I did in Boy Scouts, but I just for me I don't I don't like wasting time. Okay. And cooking for me is wasting time where I could be doing something else. So I just for some reason in my mind it's like I don't want to waste time cooking. I just don't want to do it. I'll mm. pop something if I normally if I do cook I'll eat hamburger helper, or I'll get the frozen meals where I can just yeah. pop them in the microwave and and Simple, do my stuff. Simple. Get it out of the way. Yeah. Um, so you don't really have a favorite. My favorite, like pizza. Okay. Any pizza. Love it. Um, I love Italian. So like, people ask me when I eat like like race weekends. Normally, like before a race night, like my dinner is like I want some pasta. I want to load up on some carbs, 
Chicken Alfredo, can't go wrong with Chicken Alfredo. Yeah, I love all that stuff. Like fast food, cookout, mm -hmm. love cookout. Just like not recently, but um, when Robbie, Robbie moved in, he races in the truck series and he got me hooked on Panera. And probably the worst thing that happened to me last year was Panera started delivering to my yeah. house and I dropped some dough. <laughs> on that stuff <laughs> and then they stopped they rerouted like the whatever the map that they had and i yeah. called them and i was so distraught i was like i need my panera what are you doing to me and then the more i looked at it i was like that's probably a good thing because i was eat like because i don't want to leave my house like a lot of times i'll just skip lunch altogether because i'm busy doing stuff like, I don't think I eat. I didn't eat today. <laughs> okay, so yeah, you're really bad at food then. I'm awful <laughs> at food. I, I just, what I need is I need a nutritionist to just say, this is what you need to eat. And then I need somebody to cook it for me. Right. And then I'll eat it. You know, they have, they have <laughs> stuff like that. You, you, it's called like, you know, food services. Like, there's oh. actual meal plans that people will send you. And I think all you have to do is heat it up. I need to do that. Like, prepare, like, actual pre-made Food. I need a sponsor. And the only reason I know that, <laughs> right, and the only reason I know that is because on in, I follow a lot of wrestlers on Instagram, and apparently that's all they do. That's like a thing. Yeah, is they just have all of these nutritional plans that are already cooked. They just get them sent to their house, and you just well, open it up and eat I it. I need to do some research. So maybe, yeah. <laughs> I need to definitely do some research. I'm awful at food. The next time I see some on Instagram, I'll send you some names send of me, some yeah. packages that I see on there. Be like, okay, what is that one called? I need to send it to Garrett. Please. I'm such a bachelor. Like, that's just... <laughs> yeah. That's This house is such... Like, I have my Christmas tree up 24-7. My little Christmas tree as a kid. You can't call that a Christmas tree. That thing, that's that's not even watch, like... Is that even a foot Did call? you ever watch Charlie Brown? Yeah, that's not a Charlie oh. Brown Christmas tree, though. What is that? <laughs> that's a lot fuller than what a, a Charlie Brown <laughs> Christmas tree would be. <laughs> Which, by the way, you can buy those at like CVS. Charlie Brown Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've that had. That was one. my I've childhood Christmas tree. You're ragging on my childhood Christmas. tree. I'm not tree. ragging on it. I'm just saying that's not a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Well, would you say it's a for, step for, below? For a comparison. Step below or step above? No, it's a step above. Okay. Because I'm thinking Charlie Brown Christmas tree is like literally like a stick like a with stick maybe like one leaf with on one it. One leaf and a little ornament. Yeah. So <laughs> that's that's tiny though. I'll give you that. But it's, yeah. it's nice. I decorated for and, Christmas here. And I'm all for keeping Christmas stuff up all year round. I decorated for Christmas here. Like, lights out in the house. Like, the whole nine yards. Like, one year, we put up a big Christmas tree. Decorated it. Did that for one year. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it anymore. Because I'm, I'm never here. Like, it's off season for us. I'm, I go back home for, like, a month. Yeah. Or less. It's kind this, of a waste. This year was different. I went to PRI, and I did a lot of traveling this, um, this off season. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not here to enjoy it. So I get it. And my mom, like, she is so into any holiday. Like, she's so extra with that stuff. Halloween, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Like, she's got stickies on the on the wall, and like, she made sure like our childhood. We loved our holidays. So she had a Christmas tree that was it was like a white Christmas tree, mm -hmm. and she would take the Christmas ornaments off and then keep it up for Valentine's Day. And put, yes. Keep all the red ornaments. I've on heard there. of those. Yeah. Yes. So we did that, and I think one year she did St. Patrick's. She yeah. just kept oh, it yeah. going. Oh, yeah, you can you can keep going. I just told her, just Saint keep Patrick's it up year-round. Day, day, Labor Day, Memorial yeah. Day. Fourth I mean, of July. Can, yeah, you can decorate for anything. Yeah. And then just keep the tree up. Yeah. I told her she needs to, like, open up a business doing, like, either party planning, because she's, like, an awesome party planner, or themed decorate, you know, themed decor. It's a good thing I'm broke because I'd be her number one customer. I told her she needs to just open up an inst uh, a, pin a Pinterest yeah, and post that stuff because she's, she's got some good ideas. That's awesome. So who are you hanging out with the most at the racetrack? Your teammates or who are you going to get along with? Teammates. Yeah. That's pretty much, you know, our team. We just kind of stay. So I guess we're going to get serious a little bit. Um, no, we don't have to. I'm just throwing stuff out at you. I like so I race with these guys every week and I find it difficult to like be actual like real friends with my competitors because I'm like they're competitors to me and I, it's the same like Bandolero days legend days if I was friends with somebody on the track I would race them different and I I started to be friends with every you know I want to be friends you know this, da, 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 let's hang out the more I did that the more I realized it was affecting my on track performance with them and I would give them a little bit more room and maybe I would like maybe not take that spot when I should have. Mm -hmm. 
And so then I was like, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm like, here for the trophies. So I'm not here to make friends. I'm not, like, mean. I'm not saying it in a mean way. But I'm saying, like, I struggle to, like, actually, like, have close friends at the racetrack who I'm racing with. I don't know. That's how I've always been. No, I... It, look, I think we've heard... You know, Kyle Busch or Kevin Harvick say the same thing. You can be nice to guys, mm-hmm. but you don't have to. You're not really here to make friends because you you still want to go beat the snot out of somebody. Yep. But you can respect them. I do. Yeah. I and mean, Martin Truex said that same thing after he won Kentucky. Look, we all respect each other. Yep. But we still want to go beat the crap out. Of and each there's nothing wrong with hanging out as long as it's separated. When we get to the track, really, not even when we get to the track. When we get on track and we put the helmet on, then that's your number, right? Like, like Ross and me, like we've become really good friends the past. Like we raced together for three years now. Yeah, Ross has been here. But yeah. and and we raced each other a little bit different because of the situation we're in at JD. And like Johnny would just well, teammates are one thing. Right, teammates are one thing. I'm trying to friends are you know yeah. I'm trying I mean, to think of like a situation uh, or somebody like if me and Robbie ever raced together. Like Robbie is is you know. He's my roommate, and he's my friend, and I've known him for, you know, three, four years. But when he gets in that truck, he's the 15 truck. And if I'm in a truck, that's the 15 truck. I want to beat that 15 truck. So you just, you can't, you can't have that. And if, if, if you can separate that, that's good. I don't, I choose not to put myself in that situation as much. Being around, this is my third year, third year full-time in NASCAR, fourth year in NASCAR. So I feel like going into the garage area this year, it's been different. Like more people are talking to me and like we're running better so that helps but um, it's just I feel like you know for the first year I was a rookie and people didn't really know what to how to take me just because I'm new right like they don't know anything about me and the second year a little bit better but we ran worse so maybe that played into effect and then this year it just I got to Daytona and I felt a different vibe. Like people were saying, "Hey," and people were following me on Twitter, and people are doing this, and people are doing that. And it's like, well, it seems like that I'm like a little bit more welcomed this year. More people are talking to me, and it's it's cool. It's, it's very, I don't know. I don't want to say it's clicky, but I guess it's clicky. It can be, yeah. <laughs> kind of shades of high school mm-hmm. back again. But again, I don't care. It, a I'm, lot of a lot of life is like that, though. Yeah, all I about groups and. That. and who you connect with and clicks and everything else. At the end of the day, I'm here to make my race car go as fast as I possibly can and perform as, as good as I can, and I don't want anything to get in the way of that. What is your escape from racing? Like when you don't want to do the sponsor stuff or you want to take some time to get away from hero cards and, and you're not at the racetrack, what's your escape? What gets you out of a racing mindset and completely detaches you from going in circles? There's two things two main things that I do, and it really depends on the mood that I'm in. There is putting really loud EDM music on my computer and putting headphones on and just playing whatever video game that I'm gonna play. Um, Counter-Strike is one that I play a lot. Or like some, like, uh, what's that game called? It's um, Burnout, Burnout, not Burnout. Oh, I can't remember that. It's a racing game. Okay. Like a crash up derby kind of just. So I'll put on loud music and just drive. Not iRacing because iRacing is too much like racing racing. Right. But, you know, arcade racing, first person shooters, whatever. That's one escape. My second escape, if I'm in a different mood, is to come downstairs and play the piano and just play for like an hour and just whatever. Just play. When did you learn to play the piano? Uh, Does that go back to theater? I started when I was, well, actually, it's funny. Uh, it was after church one day. My mom sang in the choir. And I was, she was, I, I don't know if she, like, she was talking to the pastor. She was, we were like the last ones in the church. And we, in Virginia, there was a really, really small church, small town kind of thing. So I was just, I went on the piano and I started like messing around and playing keys. And I didn't take any any lessons but my mom always had a piano in the house and she always would would warm up and play and all that so I started playing around and the the piano player that played for the court or for the choir was there and she asked my mom she's like has he has he taken lessons no how old is he I think I was like seven at the time she was like you know I usually don't train kids until they're like 10 but can I 
can I teach your son how to play piano? Because <laughs> I was doing it all from, from here, so uh, hearing. So, like, my first song that I ever played that I remember was um, Ode to Joy. So I played that, and she was like, he's got a really good ear. I want to teach him how to play piano. So that's where it started. Yeah. I, unfortunately, when I moved to North Carolina, I didn't retain a lot of it. So I used to like read music and I was in chorus and I was doing it every single day. So I didn't retain that part, but I can still get on there and play some chords and play some songs. And But it's all from memory. It's all from memory. So yeah. if somebody put sheet music in front of you, could you read it no. or you just have to do it? I could, I could, but I have to work really, really hard at okay. it. And I would have to sit there and do it so it's more natural instinct yes and that's really funny is because my brother does the same thing like he listening to you talk i feel like i'm talking to my brother because my brother did the same thing like he got into it in our church he just went up and started feeling he can't read music like if you put music in front of him yeah no it's like okay matt go play the piano he's like okay and he'll just sit down and just does it from Yep. I guess memory or, or feel or play, whatever play it by, is. By sound, by ear. Yeah. Yeah. I used, to, when I played, took lessons all the time, I could, you could put sheet music in front of me, I could play. I just didn't retain it. And I think a lot of that has to do with compartmentalizing where I didn't need that anymore because I put it into racing. So same with Boy Scouts. Like I didn't get to the Eagle Scout, which to this day is probably the biggest regret, regret that I ever had. But it's because when I was, like I started racing when I was 15. So when I was 15, I was not only doing theater full time, I was doing Boy Scouts and I was racing and trying to balance school, which I was really not good at. So just <laughs> trying to keep my head above water there. So something had to go. Naturally, Boy Scouts went. Yeah. Because I was racing on the weekends and I had to, there was like a certain attendance that I had to do to make these. And I said, well, I'm not going to make, if I can't make these, these outings, there's no point in continuing this. I learned what I could, and I, I'm very grateful to have that those memories, and I still have friends from there, and taught me a lot, you know, kind of growing up. Yeah, I just never, uh, something had to go, really. Yeah. I mean, there was times when, when I was doing a show, uh, I was in Willy Wonka, uh, my first, like, big, big lead, I was Charlie in Willy Wonka, my junior year, and we had a show that was scheduled, and I told the director, and this was my dream show, by the way. And so when she announced, we did Anne Frank for one at competition, and then she announced on the bus leaving one at competition that we were going to do Willy Wonka. I sat there, everyone was cheering, and I just sat there like, I want to be Charlie. <laughs> like, I, just, I didn't cheer, I didn't, like, everything just went away. I was like, I'm going to be Charlie. So I did it. <laughs> nice. But she had to move a show for me because I had a race. I was in a points battle, and she had to move a show so I could go race. So I raced in the afternoon. They moved it back like two hours so I could leave the racetrack and go do the show that night. What were you racing at the time? I think it was racing Bandoleras. Yeah. Yeah. So. And they made it work. Yep. Made it work. I was, I think I was 17. I remember, I read it, I read somewhere, I can't remember where it was. You had, somebody had asked you what your Bristol entrance song would be. Mm -hmm. And your answer was probably one of the funniest ones I've ever read. You said it would be... <laughs> The one of these songs played, and I can't remember what it's called. One of the songs played in a SpongeBob episode. Sweet Victory. Sweet Victory. <laughs> yes. So if I was to ask you something off the wall, like, "Hey, Garrett, if you could ever appear in a TV show, what would it be?" Are you going to tell me SpongeBob? I love SpongeBob. Like, I'm obsessed with SpongeBob, and it, it's the SpongeBob, you know, the first like say three or four seasons, because the new ones I I didn't I never watched. But if, it, if, if I'm flipping through TV and SpongeBob, I'm going to click on it and see which episode it is. And nine times out of ten, if it's an episode that like is old from school, that era. Old school, original SpongeBob. Yeah. Real, like hilarious. I'll watch it. I'll just, yep, yeah, I'm going to carve 15 minutes out of my day to watch this SpongeBob episode. SpongeBob and Drake and Josh. Those are my two yeah. biggest. Okay. Loved them. Right. Um, I don't know. Like, as far as TV, like. If if you had your choice to be in a TV show, what would it be? Like, like currently anything. Shark anything. Tank. Yeah. I would love to be in front of those guys, just to talk to them. A Shark Tank or The Prophet. Okay. Because I got a lot of respect for Mark Salinas. So <laughs> I was actually so when I first started racing in in the truck series, um, that's when like I started really watching The Prophet, 
and it had just started taking off. So I followed him on Twitter, and he followed me back. And I started tweeting him, and he started liking my tweets. And I said, hey, I'm going to be, and I knew that I was going to be, well, I thought I was going to be racing Daytona. I didn't end up racing Daytona, but I DM'd him. I was like, hey, are you going to be at Daytona? I'm going to be racing in the Camper World Truck Series, which Mark Slimos owns Camper World. Mm-hmm. So he was like, absolutely. Like, come come find me. I'll be there. And I was like, yes, he DM'd me. I didn't end up ever getting to meet him. But I'm, I'm obsessed with Shark Tank. I love, like, the business stuff and how they work deals and, and things like that. I love it. So probably Shark Tank. If yeah. not Shark Tank, then Big Bang Theory. Good one. I love Good Big choice. Bang Theory. Good choice. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I laugh every single episode that I've ever watched of Big Bang Theory. Have you watched Young Sheldon? No. Oh, you should. I'm not it even. Makes, it makes Big Bang Theory even funnier. I'm not even caught up on, on Big Bang Theory. I'm not I've, either, but. Oh my gosh. I used to watch TV so much, and the past year. I have just, I mean, I'm to the point where I'm almost cutting, cutting the cord. The only reason I have TV right now is to DVR the NASCAR races and the practices and all that stuff. So I can go back and, and okay. watch it. All right. So. Well, you're, you've given me a tremendous amount of time. Let's end it with this. When people hear your name or people come across to you, Garrett Smithley, what mm-hmm. do you want to be known for or thought of when, when your name comes up or people meet you or see you or think of you? Well, obviously with my end goal in mind, which is the NASCAR Hall of Fame as a driver, I want people to first off say that I'm a very talented, very good race car driver. Second, I want to be as well respected as I possibly can be. My racing here is Dale Jarrett and he's one of the most well-respected guys out there and hall of famer and just all around awesome dude and i've I've had the chance to talk to him which is just so cool and then um third i think just somebody that is just having fun at what i'm doing i mean this stuff is so difficult and so hard and so high stressed high pressure from top to bottom you're out there you know for us if you wreck it's the end of the world it really is not the end of the world but it's pretty bad so like it's so high pressure and high stress and and you know week to week you know we're gonna have this sponsor we're not gonna have this sponsor da, 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 da. but at the end of the day I'm having so much fun doing this I'm having so much fun this year it's really easy to get caught up in in, in your goals and, and what what you're trying to do but you got to enjoy what you're doing you have to go enjoy what you're doing even the bad days even the bad days because I look back at, you know, four or five years ago, I had no idea if I was even going to make it because, I mean, I was working full time for the Petty Experience and at the time it was good because I was in, I was in the car and there's way worse things in life than, than, you know, driving race cars and taking people for rides. And that was fun. But when I got to NASCAR and started racing full time, I didn't realize how much I, I wanted to be doing what I'm doing now back then I didn't I just didn't know and now I mean it sounds weird like I couldn't go back to it because of what I'm doing now it's just so much fun having such a blast so I want to make sure people know that I'm having a good time and I feel like if I have a good time and people see that I want that to kind of translate and rub off on people because at the end of the day we're entertainers and we're here maybe on on saturdays maybe on sundays fridays whatever whenever we're racing maybe that's their escape from whatever is going on with them and that's their passion they come out and see us and they pay money to see us and they they want our autographs and they want our pictures and all this stuff so if i'm having fun then i want that to translate over to them and hopefully i can i can put a smile on their face while i'm when i'm living my dream mm-hmm. tell everybody where they can follow you interact with you i know you're kind of all over the place so. yeah i uh i actually used to uh i didn't use to I, i'm still trying but um this year i had started doing like video game streaming stuff i know bubba kind of yeah. started a little bit i've just i haven't had time they're just i really want to do it some more but i just haven't had time but um social media across the board at garrett smithley twitter facebook uh instagram snapchat uh, is there anything else? <laughs> Twitch is uh, Twitch dash Twitch dash G Twitch dot TV dash G S no G forty three Smithley. <laughs> I don't know. Just it's on there. It's all on there. But at Garrett Smithley and on our websites GarrettSmithley.com. All right. Well, Garrett, thanks for letting us get to know you, and uh, I appreciate it. I'm gonna go. Have-
have to figure out these roads again here in Kannapolis. Good so. luck. <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> changed stuff around, but thanks for having me. I was uh, appreciate it, and uh, hope everybody enjoys it.